What's up? It's Way Up with Angela Yee. I'm Angela Yee. Birat is guest hosting with me. Yes. You know what? He usually leaves before the interview, but Don Cheadle's here. Gotta <laughs> <laughs> right, stay around. And, and uh, he asked me so nicely. He said, do you mind if I uh, stick around for, for Don Cheadle? I love it. But when I tell you this whole entire floor is so excited, and so am I. Oh, prepare to be very disappointed. <laughs> no. Listen, and I, and I can see the background with stand-up comedy a little. <laughs> hey, man, you know, gotta keep them laughing, right? The way they just don't stay focused on other stuff. <laughs> well, listen, and I, I did have a chance to watch the first five episodes oh, cool. of Fight Night. Fascinating story. Yeah, really interesting. You know, one that so many people have never heard of. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's not surprising that they haven't heard of it, given, you know, how our history kind of goes mm-hmm. and gets overlooked sometimes. But, yeah, really uh, interesting story about Muhammad Ali's first comeback after he, you know, was a conscientious objector to the war. Um, and uh, it's 1970, so he'd been out of the fight game for three years. And... The uh, senator in Atlanta was able to uh, find a loophole in the law and get him a a fight in Atlanta. When Atlanta was really starting to become like Chocolate City, you know, Mm -hmm. really starting to become this burgeoning mecca for black people to uh, kind of find their way as entrepreneurs and all these other, uh, you know, business models that they were able to create and vehicles for themselves at that time. Yeah, they had stripped him of his license, so he really couldn't fight anywhere. Exactly. It's interesting, and I know you come from there. I went to go see Home Mm. on Broadway. And, um, you know, the subject of home is he refused to fight in the war and ended up having to go to jail. Yep. Right. And people sometimes look at that as you dodge the draft and X, Y and Z. Some people really don't believe in a war. How do you fight for a war that you don't believe in? Absolutely. I mean, not that soldiers don't do it every day. Right. um, But to really sacrifice what he sacrificed and put it all on the line and, and really, you know, not just put his money where his mouth is, but put his reputation. He risked everything. Mm -hmm. There was no, there was no promise that he was going to be able to come back. Right. You know what I mean? And for a lot of people in the country at that time, he was a pariah. They were like, just like you said, they're like, this dude's a draft dodger. Mm -hmm. This guy doesn't, he's not a a patriot. But, you know, the other side of that coin is that that's the height of patriotism. Right. In some ways, standing up for your principles and really, fighting for what you believe is the better idea of what your country should be and what they should be doing. And when they're not, be willing to risk everything. I mean, he did something that very few people would do. Right, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You go, you try to just be stationed somewhere where <laughs> yeah. you don't have to necessarily. <laughs> but, you know, you're right about that. And we also don't think about the sacrifice that that takes because the media looks at it and people will talk about you like you are the worst person because you don't, you're not patriotic yeah. and you don't want to represent your country. But watching this it, it certainly shows me also that I didn't even realize how black people weren't supportive yeah. of Muhammad Ali during that time. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and my character is, you know, J.D. Hudson that I play is from a different era. You know, he's a throwback mm-hmm. in, in many ways. And it does bring into question what it actually means, you know. And I think, again, right now we're in a, a real moment where we're going are y'all patriots? <laughs> like, you know, all these people standing up and talking about mm-hmm. their being patriots. It's like, really? I don't know. I, I, I think it, it's it's time to redefine what that means and actually look at that in terms of uh, when you when you hold your country or you hold your leaders to a higher level of responsibility. And you know, this is this is what this moment is about. You know, who who is the real patriot? The person that just shows up and salutes and says yes, sir, and gets in line no matter what's going on, mm-hmm. or somebody who goes, no, my country has to be better than that. We have to be we have to be better than that. And I recuse myself from you know standing up and coming to the line as Ali did when I think they're acting in a way that's not in the interest of the citizenry. And you've been very, he's been very vocal too right. about talking about politics. I saw you talking about Trump, and when you talk about Trump in a negative <laughs> way, when I tell you they come for you, you let them. Yeah, come on. I mean, yeah, come on. I this always is, say it's so important who doesn't like you, just as important it is as who does like you. Absolutely. And so certain people, I'm like, good, stay over there, don't like me, don't f with me, I don't. Well, that's the either. best. Yeah, that's that's one of the best things about this moment is that you actually get to see who everybody is. Right. You know, it's like, okay, cool, let your freak flag fly. I want to know who you are. <laughs> I want to understand when I go over there that I'm PNG. You're, I'm persona non grata for you. So, yeah, just be just let's let's be real about it. I'm not. I'm not worried about that at this moment. It's it's so much more important that we uh, do what we have to do and, and come together and push back on, you know, we're, I, I think this is really a vote for, for democracy. This is really a vote for are we going to buckle under to authoritarianism or are we going to try to do something for, for the country? 
Yeah. Peter, I got to put you on blast because he said he didn't know who he wanted to vote for. Yeah, um, I, I try not to. Get, There's so much misinformation. I That's, know it's it's a lot of misinformation right now, so it's like I don't know what side of the fence I should you know ride. Well, I'm, I know. well, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I will Listen, do, and I teach it's other, like, yeah, but sometimes you know there's so much out there, and I think that Donald Trump does a, a great job of making things seem true that's not true, and just saying things like they're facts, even though they're not. And people believe what they want to believe too. You can choose to believe what's not real, right? And well, that's a choice. I think it's about your feelings. And look, he's doing something that is directly out of the mind Kampf playbook. I mean, mm -hmm. if you say a lie, of the bigger the lie, and the more times you repeat it the more that it can can you know be persuasive um and he's on the mic and he's a he's pt barnum <laughs> and you know we've we have not seen someone like this in the political arena to this degree and clearly we're not uh equipped and able to to respond in some ways and i think it is true that with all of the different places that you can go and kind of have your a la carte Mm -hmm. news experience that you don't have to listen to opposing views and you don't have to do your research. You right. can just point to one source and go see that's what they're saying. Right. Elon yeah. Musk said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and I think really <laughs> this is, you know, it's more, it's as much about feelings as it is about facts right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially for the people who are like, F your feelings. It's like, I've never seen more people in their feelings than the F your feelings people <laughs> right. in my life. They're so yeah. emotional. There. Stop it. <laughs> you know, this is really about like how mm -hmm. people connect emotionally in some ways to they you don't want that cognitive dissonance you don't want to be feeling like this is the truth but this doesn't make me feel good so let me just go to what makes me feel good mm -hmm. and i'm just gonna ride with that and people are like this dude's funny he's like he breaks the mold he's not your he regular everyday politician <laughs> he's like you know he's a tough guy it's like any of those metrics if you break them down and mm -hmm. go but really how like but really how not just just making a statement, I'm like, really show me how he's a good businessman. Right. Literally right. show me that. Please show me that. Because I can show you how he's not. I, multiple ways. <laughs> right. Everyone can show you how he's not. Show me, name one policy that he's enacted that has done anything for you that's actually going to be progressive and help you in your, in, in, in your life. And it's like, well, we were doing better under him. He, it, he was able to bring in something that was already happening before him and ride on the wave of that. Right. Those and checks that got signed, that wasn't him. He didn't he even didn't want you to get that. those checks. But what a brilliant thing he did. Right. Is like hold, he held it up, Yeah, in he fact, held the checks. Until so he, could, he sign them. could sign them. That's brilliant. I mean, it's diabolically brilliant. But it's like those kinds of things over and over again, to me, tell you the character of who this dude is. Right. And I just, you know, and what happened with the Supreme Court, which I kind of blame the hmm. Democrats for. It's like, how did we let that happen? So I think there's just, if you dig into it and you really get granular about what's happening, I don't think there's, I think there's a delta between the two choices. And right. it's not even close. And sometimes opinion. playing by the rules is what really hurts you. Because I feel like Democrats can play by the rules a whole lot. And then people who break the rules and do what they want, they'll get certain results a lot faster. But it's not done even the legal way right. a lot of times. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, I think, have seen more than anything during this term is that it's not about what you will do and if it's, quote unquote, right or wrong. It's like, what will the consequence be? And I think that's something else that Donald Trump was very astute at doing was, you know, testing the fence everywhere mm -hmm. and, and, and and exploited all of these sort of weaknesses in the system and places that we were unequipped to deal with because we never imagined they would be right. challenged. Like, did we know we needed a law <laughs> to make sure? Yeah, we didn't know yeah. that we needed to have a law that said if you're a convicted felon, you cannot be the president. Right. But that's not a law. He could be convicted and go to jail and serve from a prison, cent for prison cell. That's actually the, the law in this country. So again, yes, nobody ever thought that we would have to say anything like that, but that's something that, I mean, and it's not just him, look, you know, he's, this is, this has been in place since the think tanks happened. You know, this is, you know, Dick Cheney's still around. These guys that, mm -hmm. you know, we're under Nixon. We're, we're seeing things that are coming to fruition that were put in play a long time ago. So I just hope that people will get informed, um, not sort of equalize these choices as if they're too they're too w equally weighted this, this isn't really this democracy is in play right now for real in real in real in the real world
Well, thank you. Go ahead, Bida. I was gonna say, you're talking about character. Talk about the role you're playing in this film. Nice like, segue. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. Well, I'll, I'll go nice. It's fine. It's still nice. One segue, of the first yeah. black detectives, or the first black yeah. detective in Atlanta. I think one of the one of the first black detectives is is probably true. Um, How'd you prepare for it? Uh, crack. <laughs> I was like, no, seriously. You know, it just helps. I mean, you can go through do ex- acting exercises and research and all that, but if you really want to break some stuff open, you got to get crazy with it. No, um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of research about this guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's you can see video of him being interviewed, and um, there's just a lot of research about the police department at that time. And uh, he, the first before he was a detective, he was you know. He was he was in the first class of officers that became officers, police officers, just um, in general, mm. and then matriculated, moved his way up to becoming a detective. Um, but yeah, that that period of time, um, those his his descendants still are around, mm-hmm. you know. So, and and we also had this podcast to go off of that oh, yes. was um, shout out know, to iHeart. Yeah, shout <laughs> out to iHeart. It was really it's really a great one, um, and that's you know that plus the 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 script that Shane wrote really kind of gave us most of what we were going from. I feel like you love a true story. I think everybody kind of right. does, don't I, they? I it's mean, always more fascinating, I feel like, than a lot of times fiction. True stories are like, what? This really happened? Well, this- I, and again, to be 100, I'm going to say based on a true based, story. Yeah, you have to. Because there's yeah. poetic license we take everywhere, always when you're doing these things. Characters get, you know, combined. Other things are omitted. Things hap- hap- take place at places that they didn't take place. But the spirit of it, the 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 truth of it, not the facts of it, uh, is is clearly uh, in here. And it, it is what it is. And it's based on, yeah, this true story. And absolutely, I think it's always more fascinating because things happen in real life, as we know, mm-hmm. that if you saw in a script, I mean, let's go back to it. <laughs> if Trump <laughs> existed in a script, they'd be like, dude, take it <laughs> down. No way. Yeah. That's love, too much. You also love an accent, man. Because <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes I, mean, I hate it. Oceans and talk to you. You always perfect the accent. I, I don't know about perfect. Thank you for saying <laughs> it. Um, I, yeah, it's always that, that that's that's a grind. It's something that's been, you know. But it's part and parcel of the, yeah. of the character. It's hard for anybody, do. I think, when you have to put on, I think, Will yeah. Smith. Like, everybody's had, you know, people who are like, that was great or not. I remember when the Bob Marley movie came out, people oh, were yeah. very concerned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it, it's it's challenging. Some people yeah. can do it very easily. Some people have a real facility for it. It's not easy for me. And it's something that, you know, when you're in your trailer going over words and people are outside clowning around, you're like, dang, why do I have to do this? <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why don't I just do it as me? So Ocean's 14 is happening, it, it is? feels like. I mean, Says I keep who? on so? hearing conversations about From it. From who? <laughs> Ain't nobody called me? They call you? The, how no? could they not, though? I mean, how could they not? How could they not do it? Or not call you if they're doing it. I mean. That's impossible. Is it? We need Basher. I'm not saying that. Th- I'm just saying that we, we've seen everything happen. Okay. I'm, I imagine if it's happening, they're going to call me for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't I don't know that it's happening. I just okay. think it's been a lot of talk so yeah, far. Yeah, a lot of talk about the mm. script is ready and yeah. they've been working on it. And yeah. But you like it though, right? You would, you would be willing. Uh, say yes. <laughs> uh, I mean... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it would depend. You know what I mean? Like okay. I almost wasn't in the second one. Because, uh, interesting story, um, the the timing of it on paper at the time was going to be a direct conflict with Hotel Rwanda. Oh, mm. Hotel Rwanda is classic. classic. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to do Ooh. Ocean's 12 over Hotel Rwanda. Over Hotel yeah, Rwanda no so way. if it, I'm sorry. And then Brad playing the character Achilles in the movie mm. that he did tore his Achilles Ah, and it pushed the movie okay. eight weeks, which was the window that I was Everything able to do out. How, Ocean's How well, crazy uh, is yeah, that? Ocean's All the times well. that you probably had roles that you really wanted to do, but timing-wise, you couldn't. Yeah. You know, that has to hurt sometimes when you're like, man, I want to do it. But I, I mean, I'm going to say, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm sh- that happens, but I have rarely been in that situation. I've been very fortunate and blessed and every word you want to use to have the opportunity to do most of the things that I've I've wanted to do. In some ways, they've come together and... You know, I've just been really blessed in that way. But it doesn't always, it, it always looks easier than, mm-hmm. than on paper. Like when, when I was doing Hotel Rwanda the first day, I was at lunch. My agent called me and he's like, how's it going? I'm like, oh, it's great. He's like, you 
how are the is everything good the house and like, yeah he's like, the, the kids are good i'm like hey, the kids are in school they're good doing everything's good he's like okay um uh, i just want to let you know there's no money in escrow for the movie <laughs> I was like, I know you're like, now, I was like what are you talking about he's like uh there's no money in escrow for the movie so right now you're you're out. You're out there for free. Pro bono. Whoa, that's a scary situation. <laughs> yeah, I was like, so me. what does that mean? He's like, I, it. I don't know. He goes, I don't know what it means. It means if you stay out there, it's like I can send you tickets and you can come home. It's like my kids are in. I put my kids in school. <laughs> they're, you know, they're, I'm out wild. here with the 300 people in a production in a crew. It's like, he's like, I'm just telling you, there's no money. I said, so what's going to happen? He's like, well, Alex, who was our producer at the time, he's like, he's just going to start putting it on his credit card. And hope that this waterfall, all these different waterfalls, whenever you, so often when you make a an independent or a mm-hmm. low budget movie like that, I don't even know what the budget was on Hotel Rwanda. Maybe eight and a half, maybe ten and a half. It wasn't that much. Mm-hmm. And it went further in South Africa where we were filming it. But there's all this, this waterfall of money that has to happen. Like, right. let's say we're all producers on it. It's like, well, once Angela's money comes in, then Don's money will come in. Then BDOT's money will come in. It's like, but everybody's waiting to be the second person to put their money in. Right, right. and right. Sometimes, so, sometimes people pull out, Yeah, too, I'm that, sure. Oh, it's happened yeah. on my movie. I had a producer five weeks before the movie say, uh-huh. like, I think I have a million dollars too much exposure. And we're like, what does that mean? He's like, I'm taking a million dollars out of the movie. Wow. Now, when you have an $8.5 million budget, that's, that's like, significant. Yeah, that's almost, that's more than that's 10%. A week. Of, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a week. That's, you got to figure out locations and maybe not parts. You can, people can't put people in parts and got to lose days on things. And so it's, it's really like, I mean, that's why it's a miracle anything gets right. made outside right. the studio <laughs> system. Is it um, still, you think today though, because worse, what, yeah, harder. you think it's worse today? Because I was going to say with technology and not having to have, like, you know how they used to have to have the f- filming was different and digitizing things. Mm. I would think in a way that could make it easier, but no. Easier for who? Financially. Well, no. Look, I think that's the scary part about AI, right? <laughs> It'll be easier for them to put us in things that, you know, they don't have to pay us to be there and they don't have to, like, Right. You know, spend right. that capital on on physical human beings. And they're also using AI now to to do schedules and to do boards and to do, you know, Even day out of days and scripts. breakdowns and scripts and all that stuff. They're they're taking the jobs away from those are all people that used to do those jobs. I so, saw they they'll lay people off but then bring in a whole new department for AI and spend money in that space and less as money. opposed on need yeah, black jobs, well, man. Less money. Is that a black job? <laughs> These AI jobs are black jobs. Let's go. It was great seeing you and Sam Jack in person again. This is the second time you guys were on screen. Yeah. How was that chemistry like? It's great. Sam and I um, have a great time. You know, he he comes from a similar background, a theater actor, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, takes it really seriously and and very collaborative and down to play and find stuff. And that's kind of how I work. So I've known Sam Sam for a long time and we've been hoping to be able to do something that had something. Right. And it was nice to be able to do that. Kevin Hart really uh, his, he, Kevin Hart <laughs> I don't know who that he is did, he did an amazing job on here I do want to say that though. oh that short dude yeah yeah yeah, yeah, the yeah, show, yeah. he is short yeah. but um, he did an amazing job I For just want to yeah. put <laughs> He did best he could. I can't even imagine what this was like with you guys on camera <laughs> together. It was this every day. Yeah, every day. <laughs> every and day. Lori Harvey's in the in yeah. the series yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, how was it for you, like, as far as having people around you? Because it's all different levels of acting, mm-hmm. you know, around you. And like you said, you do come from theater. So does Samuel L. Jackson. Mm-hmm. But then you have, um, you know, people like Chloe Bailey, who's newer at it, yeah. and Lori Harvey. She's lovely. Yeah. So how is that like on set? Are you giving advice to the no, younger? No, 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 no. I mean, because you're also a director, so yeah. that could be something really helpful to have you like in yeah. a second job. On I mean, set. I've I've I'm, <laughs> I've I've worn every hat, you know, I've produced, mm-hmm. I've directed, I've written, um, and I think that that's good when you can be additive and and you can you can be helpful. And I try to be full service and not just be like, just try, take care of myself and my own performance and my thing. You have to do that. That's job one. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you have the ability to see around a corner and understand that, oh, this is something that would be helped if we did this or that or move this this way, to, you know. And then, you know, you mentioned Sam. Again, dude who's steeped in the game. And Taraji, too. Yeah, and Terrence, Taraji. too. Terrence, too. Oh, my too. gosh. I we mean, this all is an have a lot of years. cast. Right. You know, so, there, so there's a lot of years. And when we're all pulling in the same direction and trying to accomplish the same things, then it's it's helpful and it's it's necessary because you never have enough time. Right. You right. know, you never have all the resources you need. 
And you can be an impediment to the process if you sit on your heels or, you know, just make it me, me, me. Mm-hmm. And that was not what this experience was at all. Um, everybody, like I said, was 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 on board with the story and wanted to really get the best out of it. My character, I'm on one side. Of, you've seen the first right. five. I'm like on one side of the show for most of the show. And it's not until the fifth or sixth episode, I think, when it's I kind of start to even meet those other characters. Right. So um, that that was a whole, it, you know, it was kind of happened in two parts for me. Right. There were some really key parts in here where I, that I loved um, that you had. For instance, like when you found out you had to protect Muhammad Ali. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was a moment when he was fighting and you were like, yes. I was like, yeah. finally, some of, I mean, this right. is Muhammad Ali. Because right. it seemed like at first you didn't even want that job. No. So why was that a job that would have been considered something that was like beneath what you do? Well, it's or- not what he was that's how how is that get you on your path to being a detective mm-hmm. you know how is that actually police work i think for jd police it's like work, security exactly <laughs> exactly now I that's, that's exciting. you get to go to the fight you yeah, get to hang out with like, muhammad ali yeah but that ain't what he that's not what his character ever was in it for he really had uh you know a path that he was trying to be on and taking this detour to make sure that this guy doesn't get assaulted which also looks like a sucker play for him Mm -hmm. it's like the amount of death threats that he had and the amount of hatred that was around him he's like now what happens if this dude gets shot on my watch now i'm like demoted for a thing i didn't even want to do (laughs) you know so i think from jd's perspective this was not you know this was a sidestep at best and even some in some ways a demotion okay what does jd's family think about your role i have not talked to them but Mm -hmm. no one's showed up with the the, you know, no picket arsenic. Sign. Or, that's so be exciting. Right. You know, Don Cheeto's playing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, look, there's a lot of, and as you said, I've done this a, a, a lot. I've played real life characters, and I've had, you know, when we did when Hotel Rwanda screened at the Toronto Film Festival, the guy who I played and his wife sat right next to me during this. Pressure. Yeah, lots of pressure. That is a lot of pressure. Lots right of next pressure. To you. So that's you know, it's great to have them as a resource, and it's great to have them there to be able to to <laughs> check with and, and and you know, when I played the goat, when I did Man you know goat. rebound, he mm-hmm. was there. Earl Manigault was there. So it's again, it's great, but it is it can be intimidating. Right. You've worn many hats, like you said earlier, and you're also a multi-time Grammy Award winner. Um, Ten years ago, you starred next to Jay Z in the Run trailer. <laughs> That's right. Can you talk about that experience? Uh, it was brief, <laughs> <laughs> but we had a good time. You know, uh-huh. um, we shot a little like improv video where we were playing poker and just like we we're just improv. It doesn't really show up a lot in the. Really? Wow. You don't see, hear it in the video. Um, mm-hmm. It's all the song, but yeah, there's a whole scene that we just improv and 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 we're messing around with, and it was fun to do. It's fun to do. And Kendrick. Kendrick. And Kendrick. Of course, K Dot. Yeah. Does that mean you paid attention to like the battles? I know you like hip hop, so were you paying attention to? How could you not pay attention? <laughs> like, you know, under a rock. Like, what happened? No, I, I, attention was paid. Um, <laughs> and you know, to talk about acting, like when we shot that video, Kendrick was so like with it. You mm-hmm. know, what I mean, he was so like between takes. You know, in the in, in our part of the video, he's handcuffed to the table. And he's, you know, doing this whole stuff in cuffs and we cut and they would go to take the handcuffs off and he'd be like, no. no. In character. Mm. He's in character. He stayed in them the whole video. I was like, he, does he know that he doesn't have to leave these <laughs> off when the camera's he's off? Maniacal, he's so. like, no, he's dead, like really committed. And I had wanted him. And he was someone that I had uh, thought about casting in my movie that I did miles ahead and have him play the, the, the role mm-hmm. of Junior. Mm. And. We talked about it for a long time, and he was ultimately he said, "I I don't think I'm ready to do that, and I'm kind of working on a project right now, and I kind of don't want to like I have to see that through, and I also don't want to come in here halfway." And I'm like, "No, I get it." And it was to pimp a butterfly. I was like, "I think you made the right, right. choice on that one." Ooh, that's commendable because somebody would have been like, "Let me pause my album because that's a huge yeah. opera. Wow, I he can't knew. even imagine that. He, but that's what I'm saying. He's that kind of a dude, and he had called me up one day, and um, he's like, "What are you What are you doing?" And I kind of took a, a screenshot of when I was writing the movie and I had all these three by five cards laid out on the on the counter and he's like, what is that? I'm like, oh, I'm just trying to figure out what scenes go where and how to organize mm-hmm. that. And he's like, why would you do that? And we were on the phone for an hour wow. 
with him just so curious and mm-hmm. so inquisitive about the writing process and how it works and how do you prepare this and why would you move that scene there? I was like, wow, this dude's just a That's curious. Wow. He's just a very curious dude. I, yeah, I did Kendrick a lot. Ooh. And then um, we were talking about how you really do get into these roles. And even after you did Hotel Rwanda, you were very involved in making sure that you were active mm-hmm. um, when it came to Darfur and everything. Mm-hmm. So tell me about the impact that movie had on you and why you were so intentional after that and still continue to make sure you bring attention. Well, that that was something that it wasn't a plan. You know, I didn't go into it with I, I, when I took the movie. I didn't I didn't know anything about what had happened right. in it Rwanda. It affected you. And I saw a frontline documentary, which is amazing about it, and you know, tragic and really, really sad. But that was the first I became interested in it. And then after the movie came out, uh, we were approached by a bunch of congressmen, mm-hmm. Democrats and Republicans, and they were getting ready to go on a CODEL. A congressional delegation was getting ready to go to Darfur, mm-hmm. or not? They couldn't get into Darfur, but they were going to go to they were going to go to Chad. They were going to meet with the African Union to try to bring attention and awareness. And we did a screening at MGM, and they said, we're going to go on this CODEL. Would you, do you want to go with us? I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know. So on the way over, you know, we, they briefed me about everything that was happening. Uh, I brought another guy, John Prendergast, who I co-wrote a book with, and, uh, and Paul Recessabagina, who I play in, the, in Hotel Rwanda. We all went. Uh, on this congressional delegation, and then when they left, we stayed mm-hmm. behind, and we were actually uh, able to, with the African Union, we snuck into Darfur wow. through mm. Chad. We snuck into Sudan wow. um, and saw one of these villages and saw what the aftermath of that and went to a refugee camp. And just having that experience, you just become sensitized in a way that is different than just hearing about it. Right. You know, meeting survivors of of the genocide, talking to people on the ground who have experienced it firsthand, meeting with these NGOs who have committed their lives and dedicated their lives to to bringing awareness and trying to stop this. You personally, not every, and, and I, and it's not. I don't think it's everyone's responsibility. I'm not saying it like, how could you not? I'm going. I could not. You could mm. not. How could After you not? After I walked right. away, be like, well, I got this platform and I have all this ways, I think, to raise awareness and attention. But now nah, I'm not going to do that. I was like, how? What can I do? What can we do? Mm-hmm. And how can we become involved to try to stem the tide? And we did a lot of different things. You know, we tried a lot of things. And for a moment, it looked as if there was going to be, um, you know, there was a ceasefire. It was looking like there was going to be another civil war. But right now, you look at the continent and you see what's not the country, the country now, and it's it's devolved pretty dramatically. It's 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 really bad. There's a huge humanitarian crisis there that uh, that at levels that we saw before, you know, not more than even before when it looked like it was uh, when the genocide was happening. So it's it's really one of those things where you take two steps forward and take three steps back, right. and you have to. You know, continue to double down and try to keep doing what we're doing. Thank you for asking because it gives me the opportunity to talk about it again. Right. No, I appreciate that. And I and like you said, everybody is not responsible to do that. But I feel like how could you not when you have an opportunity to see something like that and then say, what is my responsibility as a human being? Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, And then the movie Crash, of course, that was a phenomenal movie. But that was something that you also came on to produce, right? Yeah, I was the first producer on that. You were the first producer, and you were the first first person. Bobby Moresco was Paul's close friend, and he was also... uh, Produce it, and Paul produced it as well. Yeah, and you were the, but you were the first actor to sign on. Mm-hmm. So, so that really helped everybody else kind of get on board too. Yeah, yeah, I, I went, <laughs> yeah, I, I went around the country and talked to folks <laughs> and grabbed people and you know hired Did you people really? And, you really physically went? Yeah. And, so you got Ludacris in there, Chris and um, Terrence. <laughs> yeah, you know, and now uh, here you and Terrence Howard are again. <laughs> yeah. Terrence Howard's hair was flawless in this amazing um, right? in Fight Night. By the way, I, as soon as he came on the screen, I was like, I like that hair. Yeah. It was like a, <laughs> Like a white Barbie doll. He had a nice, yeah. <laughs> he was quaffed. <laughs> Pressed. Um, but yeah, so that was an important story you felt like, well, stories to be able to tell. Well, I just, it, that was purely from an artistic standpoint. I read the I read the script and I was like, wow, this, this it's rare that I, I read a script and I'm like, I wouldn't change it. You know where I'm like, mm-hmm. this is great. Um, I saw, I mean, people were really upset with that movie, I think, that, in some ways, maybe didn't take it as uh, it was. It was an allegory to me. It wasn't supposed to be seen as literal as mm-hmm. as much as it was a bunch of what ifs, right? You know, because of course all these storylines overlap kinda, yeah. and intersect, and 
you know, life doesn't work like that. But um, in this instance, I thought it was really, you know, a compelling story. And yeah, Paul and I went around to studio after studio after studio trying to raise the money for that. And, and yeah, and part of what I did was try to talk to actors and get them to say yes. You think Hollywood is better now than it was when, it has to be better than when you first started. A, in what, what you, regard? As, as far as like getting work, getting the respect no. that you, no? Mm, hell no. Because wow. I would feel like Don Tito. Oh, you mean for me personally? Yeah, for you. Well, okay, yeah, let's look at it Yeah, let's ways. look, yeah, what's the bucket? I feel like it's a, Don Tito can make a call. You don't have to audition for anything. No. but right, that's but that, but I don't. But I think it's, you know, conversely harder to find the kinds of projects that I want to do. Mm, okay. You know, and to w- even if you do find the kind of project to actually get it over the the finish line. It's very difficult right now. I think Hollywood is quote unquote Hollywood writ large um, is suffering. And you can see that in how these, you know, legacy studios are, you know, mm-hmm. I think Warner Brothers wrote down 9 billion dollars in, <laughs> in losses this year and then yeah. Paramount came out and they're 9 billion behind. I mean, yeah. there's you're going to see like three studios in the future. There's going to be like, you know, right. two places mm-hmm. or three places to make movies and the movies that they're going to make are going to be these tent pole four quadrant huge movies because they have to try to to get their money back. So they're taking many, many fewer shots than they used to take. Right. And it's hard to find the money. And, this, of course, streamers completely changed the game. Yeah, same and thing in the music these, business. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, it's right. happening everywhere. And, it, like again, if you could see around a corner, you would, would be able to see this coming. And um, it's harder and harder for artists of all walks to... To, to to find ways and places and finances and opportunities to get these important or not even important because that's a medicine word, but to mm-hmm. get these special, you know, um, authentic to them mm-hmm. and sort of particular things made because it's hard to make the argument to somebody who's going to be paying for it, right. how they're going to get their money out of it. Uh, we were talking about Francis Ford Coppola and how yeah. he did Megalopolis and he he uh, borrowed a hundred million dollars against his wine company yeah. to get it done, but it made like between five and seven million dollars. Yeah, exactly. The first week in the box office, and that's what I'm saying. Right. So, and they will point to that as a reason to not ever do that again. So everything is is in the rearview mirror. Like, what has it done for me lately? You know, mm-hmm. how did it do in the past? And people are always trying to chase that thing that worked before. Mm-hmm. And we know that that's rarely, if ever, how anything original and interesting gets made. You know, okay. it's it get you know if people are trying to just you know replicate what's come before, it's just going to be the bunch of the kind, same kind of stuff we've seen. And you guys know, we all know as consumers, there's that that there's a zillion things out there, but. How many things are you like dying to look at? Well, Marvel's it's, usually a sure shot. Right, I was going to say, <laughs> is it difficult because you're part of one of the um, highest grossing yeah. movies of all time? I am. <laughs> difficult in what way? Difficult because it's like other non uh, comic based movies might not necessarily get the same sort of appreciation or Absolutely. notoriety. It's difficult for Marvel too, quote right. unquote. I mean, right. it's like, I, I, look, I think it's not easy for, for anyone right now in this business, given what has happened post COVID post strikes, you know, pre what's happening in this election, Mm -hmm. post everyone trying to figure out how the money's going to cut, who's going to get what. Every studio kind of messed itself up trying to chase Netflix. Netflix is the only one that's crushed it and is still crushing it and figured all that stuff out. And there's a lot of um, tap dancing right now happening. There's a lot of uncertainty and and layoffs Mm -hmm. and... You know, it, it, it's sweaty and it's sweaty in Hollywood right now, mm. for sure. Well, and listen, not just because of that tape. Don Cheadle has to go, but you. This was such a blessing to have yes. you here today. Honestly, like. And where's the? A, so I thought it was. I thought there was like some money that was supposed to happen. <laughs> yes, the check is in the mail. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> Actually, sentence. um, Kevin Hart has it. So oh, I'm never know. seeing this. Money. Ninety. <laughs> 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 but it's, make sure you guys watch Fight Night. Yes. It is a amazing, amazing series. When I tell you, when I first started watching it, that's definitely a binge worthy um, show to get into. And it's got its funny moments. It's got you on the edge of your seat. Taraji, yes. I mean, that right. moment where she had to. Yeah, man. Oh, my. Well, that's all I have to say. He knew exactly yeah, what I was talking yeah, about. You got to watch it if you haven't watched it. But I feel like people are into it. And shout out to Will Packer, too. Yes. Shout out to Will Packer. Yeah, I love the work that he does and yeah. he's so supportive of other creatives as well and I think that's a safe place for people to feel 
like I can work with Bill Packer and feel good like no on doubt. set. Yeah, he 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 put it down this, for sure on this one. On set must have been so much fun. I can't even imagine. Yeah, with that, in spite with that of Kevin cast. Hart, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> this might be real. All right. Well, anyway, <laughs> it's way up with Angela Yee, Don Cheeto. Yep. Thank you. Way up.